Um, today, our panel will be speaking to you about the seafood processing industry, looked at the harvesting and processing sectors and discussion of its status and outlook for 2021. Our guest speakers have also been asked to identify any issues or policies the industry may seek or anticipate in light of both the new administration and current circumstances as businesses are adapting to the pandemic. I'd like to highlight just a few points about the seafood industry's economic impact on Alaska before we hear details from our panel. The seafood industry contributed $5.6 billion in economic output to Alaska's economy in 2017 and 2018, including the harvesting, processing, and support sectors. About 58,700 workers were directly employed by Alaska's seafood industry, earning $1.7 billion in wages annually. There were 29,400 skippers, active permit owners, and crew who fished in Alaska, of which 56% were Alaska residents. Clearly, this is an important economic sector for Alaska. We appreciate our panel being here today to help us understand the seafood industry's role in powering Alaska's economy. This is especially important as Alaska makes policy decisions on how to move our economy forward as we recover from the pandemic. At this time, I'd like to introduce our virtual head table. First, we have Jeremy Woodrow, who's Executive Director, Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. We have Francis Leach, Executive Director for the United Fishermen of Alaska. We have Chris Barrows, who's President, Pacific Seafood Processors Association. And last, we have Stephanie Madsen, Executive Director for At Sea Processors Association. So I'm gonna give our thanks today for, to our head table for joining us. Before getting started with our, our panel's discussion, I'd like to thank the Commonwealth North members who are online with us. We are grateful for your participation in programs, study groups, and your commitment to citizen engagement in public policy. Commonwealth North was founded to provide a nonpartisan public policy forum to help Alaskans better understand some of the most complex issues impacting our state. For those of you who are not members, thank you for your interest and engagement, and we invite you to join Commonwealth North and support our mission to eliminate Alaska's most critical issues. So with that as an introduction, uh, I am now pleased to begin our panel discussion with Jeremy Woodrow, Executive Director of the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. Jeremy, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Great, thank you, Scott. Uh, let me share my screen here. I do have a presentation to share. And hopefully you can see that just fine. Oh, excuse me there. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So uh, thank you, Scott. Once again, my name is Jeremy Woodrow. I'm the executive director for the Alaska Seafood Market Institutes. Uh, I'm just going to provide a, a brief update on uh, the market conditions for Alaska seafood, what we're seeing here in the U.S., uh, a little bit here in Alaska, and then also how the um, entire global market is responding uh, to current issues uh, that really surround the pandemic. Um, first, just want to introduce who uh, ASME is, or who the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute is. Uh, we are Alaska's official seafood marketing arm. Uh, we are a state agency, um, and we're written in statute to maximize the economic value of Alaska's seafood resource. Uh, we do this through building the Alaska seafood brand, uh, developing seafood markets across the world, and we work closely with this Alaska seafood industry uh, to make sure that our efforts are aligned with their priorities. Um, we're a public-private partnership between the state and the industry. Uh, we have a board of directors that's appointed by the governor. We also have several ex officios that make up administration officials as well as uh, legislators. Uh, and we also have several species and operational committees that are uh, made up of industry members um, who help direct and provide guidance to ASME staff and um, ASME marketing efforts. Um, I have a short video to, to share with everyone. I think it's a great way to start off and, and just really, you know, kind of, actually a lot of this emphasizes what Scott just shared about his introduction for the Alaska Seafood Industry. And um, I think it's a great way to introduce just uh, the importance of the seafood industry to kind of kick off this panel today.
Excellent. Uh, I, I love that video. Um, you know, I think it, it really, really encapsulates how, how significant the seafood industry is to the state of Alaska, as well as to the United States. Um, you know, I know those facts that came scrolled across the screen there go quickly. So if there's anything you want to take away from that, it's that, um, you know, the Alaska seafood industry, uh, you know, employs, is the largest private sector employer in the state of Alaska. Um, it can, it's definitely a cornerstone of our, of our state's economy. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't for Alaska, the seafood industry across the U.S. would, would be a much different landscape. Um, we produce 60% of the wild-caught seafood here in our nation. And uh, for many regards, Alaska is why the U.S. is a seafood-producing nation. Um, the pie charts in front of you right now, uh, just uh, share really quickly about uh, how much our fishermen here in the state of Alaska harvest and what that returns in value. When we talk about ex-vessel volume, that is what the fishermen actually harvest. Uh, and this stats are a couple of years old from 2018. Uh, and the harvest wasn't down, wasn't changed too much in 2019. And, and we'll talk about 2020 challenges here in a bit. Um, the, when we talk about ex vessel value, that's that first payment to fishermen. So that's what a processor or that first person that purchases it actually pays to the fishermen. So about 5.8 billion pounds translate into about $2 billion worth of value. Um, you'll notice that when you look at this pie chart here, these two pie charts side by side, you notice that there's a big difference in the, the percentages for some products as volume compared to what they actually pay out. And so really when you look at this, I, I think the best way to, to cover this is that Alaska has a lot of um, high volume uh, and uh, lower value species or more affordable species when we look in the marketplace. And then we also have a lot of lower value but very high value products such as our halibut, sablefish and crab species. Uh, and I think those uh, probably stick out the most significantly when you look at the fact that halibut, sablefish and crab represent only 2% of the total catch but nearly a quarter of the total value um, to our state and to our industry. Um, so there's, there's a demand and there's a place in the market for, for everything that comes out of our waters. And that's truly uh, represented in this chart here. Um, so when it's sold, when the processor purchases it, um, uh, they turn that around into about 2.8 billion pounds of products. Uh, and it represents about $4.7 billion of value. So that's, these charts here are just to show um, what, what happens next and then the supply chain. And then the value continues to grow as it continues to move out to restaurants, food service, and maybe e-commerce. How does Alaska compare to the world? I always love uh, sharing this chart as well. Um, and Alaska represents about 2% of the total production of seafood in the world. And it might sound small, but when you think about the fact that we aren't even a country, this is comparing us to everything in the world. And the fact that we're even taking out a sliver and you can actually see the sliver in this pie chart here, it actually says that Alaska is a, we're a pretty significant player, though we don't, we're not necessarily um, the big dog in, in when it comes to, you know, in total production, but we, we do make a difference. Uh, we make a difference in, in feeding the world and making a difference in making sure the world is receiving um, a sustainable, wild, and very nutritious resource. Uh, so let's talk about a little bit about what happened last year in 2020. Um, you know, we're all living through the pandemic. We all lived through this last year. And, and so some of these uh, stats should come as no surprise. Um, the first bullet here, and, and this is really the most significant impact we saw overnight. And this is pretty much exactly a year ago when restaurants closed worldwide. Um, and why that is significant? Well, just here in the U.S. alone, uh, approximately 70% of all seafood that's consumed in the US is consumed at a restaurant or in a food service sector. Once again, that's 70%. Imagine losing 70% of, of your business overnight and having to rethink and recalculate where you're going to distribute your product. Well, that instantly impacted the value of our species. Um, over here on the right, the, the total impact of the course of the year, not just from restaurants, but just all the different complications that came with dealing in the pandemic. We're, we're expecting about a 20 to 25% reduction in the, in the overall value of Alaska's harvest. Uh, and, if we, and that's ex vessel value. So if you go back to a couple of slides ago and we estimate the, the annual value, ex vessel value around $2 billion, that means in 2019 or 2020, excuse me, the estimated value is about $1.5 billion. And that's going to impact every single aspect of the industry, whether you're an ancillary business who provides products or services to the seafood industry, or you're a community that relies on those, those fisheries taxes to help um, uh, keep things moving in, in your community, whether it's from schools, harbors, and roads. Um, and, and so really, we're still living through this. And I know the other panelists will talk about some of these challenges, and so I won't hammer this too, too hard. Um, but how did consumers respond? Um, we're all consumers, and so we all responded differently, but we saw some trends over the last, last year. And some of these trends are actually fairly positive. Um, while we lost 
um, the food service sector, which was incredibly negative, um, people had still still had a demand for seafood and those sales had to come somewhere and those sales came out of retail and e-commerce um, e-commerce had an amazing year everybody was buying something online and seafood was part of that equation uh, we saw 122 percent increase just in seafood e-commerce in the year over year this last year that's incredible um, seafood really had a moment in direct sales um, being shipped to consumers doors and we expect that's going to stick around um, the best part about the retail um, growth as well is that more people were purchasing seafood and cooking seafood at home than ever before. Um, we've really turned the corner on, on, on introducing seafood into the household. And that's been a challenge, not just for Alaska seafood, but for the entire seafood sector for, for pretty much forever, is making sure more people eat seafood at home. Um, ASME has really been working hard to uh, educate consumers to make sure that, they don't, that this, these aren't just one-time purchases and these become repeat purchases and that seafood stays part of that menu planning that households go through before they make their purchases either in a retail store or before they add items to the cart online. Um, but we're not out of the woods. Uh, we definitely have many challenges um, looking ahead. Um, restaurants aren't 100% back yet. We're seeing rolling openings and rolling closures across the world. Uh, and there's a good chance that a lot of restaurants aren't ever going to come back. Um, the stats that we've, we've seen on restaurant closures are, are frankly very scary. Um, some, some estimates are that anywhere from a 25% to 50% of some restaurants, uh, especially white tablecloth restaurants, won't open. And when we talk about the value and the high value of some of our products, we really need some of those high scale restaurants to move product and introduce consumers to these uh, to, to valuable forms of seafood that come out of our waters. Um, we also compete against other proteins, especially other seafood proteins, and they're having the same challenges we are. Um, we're seeing that a lot of farm species are driving prices down, and that's also putting pressure on the entire category and, and impacting our prices. Um, and outside the pandemic, we have other, other issues uh, that are continuing to be challenges too, such as trade barriers. We still have an ongoing trade war with China. Uh, we have uh, some uh, trade barriers getting into Europe. Uh, Brexit is still ongoing and negotiations with that are underway. And with a new administration, there's uh, new people that need to be brought up to speed on some of these challenges. And seafood is just one player in all these negotiations when we come talk about trade barriers. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. So there are opportunities. I talked about uh, the fact that uh, more people are buying seafood than ever before. Um, we also know that there's a pent up demand. People want to return to restaurants when they feel that it's safe to do so. And so we do expect as this light at the end of the tunnel that continues to grow brighter, that there will be opportunity in the food service space and that there will be growth. Um, that comes with the caveat though. Uh, what we're learning um, is that restaurants are, are retooling what it means to, to be able to survive and to, to turn a profit. And some of that retooling means to change their menus. Um, if anyone that's, that's watching right now is familiar with the cheesecake factory style menu where you have 30 pages of options to choose from, we're not going to see that moving forward in the future. Restaurants are really going to scale back to less menu items. And, and why that's a challenge for seafood is maybe at a higher end restaurant or even a, a mid-range restaurant, you might see three or four seafood options. Well, moving forward, you might only see one or two, and that might be one appetizer and one main dish. And so there's gonna be a lot of competition just to get your product line on those menus, uh, whether it's a chain restaurant or, or a high scale restaurant in a, in a city somewhere. And so, um, you know, we were all looking forward for the food service market to rebound, but it, it's there's going to be challenges moving ahead to make sure that we still are front and center in those menu options. Um, and we also expect that consumers are going to continue to shop online. I talked about that entire uh, huge growth. That's great opportunity. It's a great opportunity to tell the Alaska seafood story as well. Um, when consumers are, are purchasing directly from the source, they want to learn more about where their product is coming from as well. And you can provide more, more materials in that purchase. Um, you can include pamphlets and recipes and, and other inf information that will help them repeat that purchase. Um, and then the, uh, another thing that came out of the pandemic is everyone's reevaluating what it means to be healthy and making sure that they're making healthful minded decisions, whether that is in exercising more and also making sure that they're eating um, the foods that will keep them healthy and seafood checks that box. 
Uh, we all know seafood is healthy. People who eat seafood um, have, are less frequently to have heart disease and a whole other host of, of issues that they can avoid because seafood is good for you. Uh, and so people are looking at, at healthy options and it's just making sure that Alaska seafood is part of making those choices for them and making sure that we're front and center of those purchasing decisions. Um, so I, I wanted to be quick today because we do have a, a packed panel. And uh, last thing I want to add is that so we have teamed up with the McDowell Group, which is now McKinley Research, uh, to produce frequent uh, COVID-19 impact reports on the Alaska seafood industry. If anyone would like to read those reports and learn more about um, the impacts of the seafood industry, they can go to alaskaseafood.org forward slash COVID-19. And uh, those reports are published online and we put those up there uh, about every other month or so we have new information to report back on. And that concludes my presentation today. Looking forward to answering any questions that may come along. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. We will now hear from Francis Leach, Executive Director of United Fishermen of Alaska. Francis, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, I am unable to share my screen. It says host disabled participant screen sharing. So I can... Just give me one second. No worries. Glad to know I'm not the only one who does that. <laughs> okay, you should be able to do something. There some. we go. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? I think so. Okay, well, thank you so much, Commonwealth North, for having me today. I'm really honored to be representing United Fishermen of Alaska um, and letting me tell you a bit about the fishing sector and what is going on here. So for those of you who are not familiar with UFA, we were started in 1974 by a group of commercial fishermen who wanted to have a more unified voice in the state of Alaska. We have several priorities, as you can see here. I'll just read a few of them. Um, we promote positive relationships between industry, industry sectors. We support all commercial gear types, which is really important because we have a very diverse board of directors with member groups. Um, we protect industry um, from attacks through um, legislation, promote industry safety, um, we promote healthy fisheries, we support funding for fisheries and management, we're very against fish farming, we support the development of new fisheries, I guess I am just going to read them all to you, um, we educate um, industry, government, and the public, and we support efforts to increase consumption of Alaska seafood, um, we rely heavily on ASME for that. Um, promote quality standards and protect consumer access to seafood by maintaining a stable supply of product to our processors. We currently have 36 member groups in our organization and as you can see they span across every single coastline, um, co fishing coastline, commercial fishing coastline in Alaska. So we're really proud of our diverse group. We've got all different gear types, all different species types. Um, it's a very diverse group and we're very proud of that. Um, I'm going to talk to you mainly today about some of the current policy issues that we're facing as commercial fishermen, but I, it would be neglectful of me not to talk a little bit about COVID and how that has impacted our industry. Um, about this time last year, we were wondering how we were going to even manage to have our fisheries. Um, there were communities that were saying they didn't want commercial fishing to happen in their, their small communities. Um, so it took a lot of lifting from a lot of different people, several of which are um, on this panel, um, to help form um, a group and get information. And we were lucky enough to get our own mandate. Um, I don't know if I should say lucky, but it did allow us to fish, which was very important. Um, and UFA ended up being kind of a clearinghouse for all sorts of information and distributing it to the fleet. Um, at the end of the salmon season, we were commended by the gov governor and the administration for all of our hard work, which was, was really good, um, you know, just because it was a very heavy lift and we were really thankful that we were able to get through the busiest part without any major outbreaks. So um, I'll be switching gears now and talking about our UFA policy work. Um, we have to, um, if it has to do with fishing in Alaska, we're going to be covering it. Um, we're always very engaged at the state and the federal level. At the state level, we work closely with the governor's office, the Alaska legislature, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Commercial Fisheries Entry Commission, Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, Board of Fish and DEC. 
On the federal side, we work closely with Congress. We're always communicating with our Washington DC delegation. We work with National Marine Fisheries Services and NOAA, the US Coast Guard, North Pacific Fisheries Management Council, the International Pacific Halibut Commission, USDA and DEC. So as you can um, see here, we've got our hands in several pots, constantly keeping our um, mind on what's going in the pulse of fishing. Okay, um, even though you know COVID was quite the heavy lift, um, policy work still goes on and there's a lot that affect commercial fishermen. Um, we're barely two months into the 32nd legislature and we are already tracking 32 bills that pertain to commercial fishermen. Um, the governor's proposed 2022 fish and game budget was flat funded this year, which we were very thankful for that there were no cuts. Um, I do find it sometimes surprising that for an industry that pays over $172 million in taxes and fees and self-assessments, um, that we sometimes can't get a fully funded fish and game budget, especially since that $172 million is four times the amount that it costs to run the Division of Commercial Fisheries. Um, our other legislative issues that we track are appointments for the CFEC, Board of Fish, and North Pacific Marine Fisheries Council. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we're tracking 32 bills right now. Um, and I'm sure by the time this legislative session is done, it will be twice this many. But right now, I'll just give you a quick lowdown of some of the ones that we are really um, pushing for and tracking. HB 26, which is a bill that UFA has been supportive of for a very long time. It's the conflict of interest bill. And what this bill does is it allows Board of Fish and Board of Game members to participate in deliberations um, when a proposal comes up. Oftentimes, Board of Fish and Board of Game members are chosen because of their expertise um, that they bring to the table. But as the rules state now, the statute state now, they're not allowed to participate in deliberations. And so we're kind of muting the experts at the table. This would not allow them to vote, um, but it would allow them to offer insight and answer questions. So we're very supportive of that. The next one is House Bill 28, which is the registration of votes. This was left over, um, this is a correction um, bill, left over from the derelict vessel bill. The idea of that was to create a statewide database to track all vessel owners in the state of Alaska. And that way, when someone abandons their vessel, the state knows who to contact to take care of it. Problem was, is commercial fishermen already have a statewide database that tracks the owners of vessels, and that's through the commission, um, the CFEC. So we were asking for an opt out, um, and that is what this bill does, is that if you are registered with the CFEC, you're already in a database, they can find you if you, for some reason, decide to abandon your boat um, and track you down. So we're hoping for the passage of that. HB 41 and its companion bill, SB 64, are for shellfish projects. Um, what this will do is it'll allow the Department of Fish and Game to authorize and manage more shellfish enhancement projects and set out more permits. It's going to set stringent guidelines and safety standards to make sure we're still protecting our wild stocks. But what it's really going to do is it's going to allow for a larger scale of shellfish enhancement projects in the state and it's going to open up the door for more grants and federal funding and just a lot more opportunities for commercial fishermen. And then last, or no, we got the sport fish hatchery facility bill. Um, this bill comes from the governor and it's meant to um, remedy the discontinuation of the Southeast salmon enhancement programs, which help fund our Southeast hatcheries. This is a program that has been going on for several years. Unfortunately, it expired and the legislature had to um, adjourn early last year because of COVID. So we're hoping to get this one back up because it is very instrumental for our hatcheries to continue to be offering the, um, what they do with this money. And last but not least, the seafood development tax credit. This is a very important one too. And what it's trying to do is it's trying to bring value added um, salmon and herring products to the market. So if a processor were to purchase new equipment that could help make a new product that they could market, they are eligible to receive um, reimbursement for that. And what this is gonna do is it's going to encourage entirely new products um, to introduce to the market. And a lot of those products will be from um, otherwise what may have been fish waste. So this is a great incentive. 
Our other state priorities that we focus on are Board of Fisheries. Usually UFA doesn't get too involved in Board of Fish issues unless it's a statewide issue or one that's gonna have far reaching effects on our entire industry. Also, we work a lot with transboundary mining issues and pebble mine. UFA is not anti-mine at all, but we do ask for responsible mining practices and understand that there are some regions that are just not compatible with fish habitat. Okay, federal policies. And I would like to point out that Stephanie Madsen, who is one of our panelists today, she is the chair of our UFA National Committee. So Stephanie, feel free to jump in if I botch anything here. So the draft MSA is something that we're working on. This is the Magnus and Stevens Act. Um, Congressman Jared Huffman of California is doing a rewrite of it. Um, UFA had the opportunity to meet with him a few weeks ago, and our message to him was, please just leave it alone. <laughs> we like it the way that it is. Um, so he has said that he will be continuing to work with us, and so we look forward to that. Um, Biden put out an emergency order conserving our nation's land and water. This is also known as, the, we call it the 30 by 30. The intent of this EO is to tackle the climate crisis at home and abroad um, by creating jobs, restoring, restoring scientific integrity across federal government. Of course, as we know in Alaska, with protections come very um, various issues that Alaskans, um, you know, we're very different here and we run things differently. So UFA has been engaged on this and we'll be tracking it. And I highly suggest that all Alaskans pay attention because this goes for land and water. HR 59 is strengthening fishing communities and increasing flexibility in Fishery, Fisheries Management Act. This was created by, um, drafted by Don Young um, and is hopefully going to provide flexibility for our fisheries managers and more stability for fishermen. Keep Fin Fish, Keep Fish Free Act. It should say Fin Fish, I apologize. Not fish free, but Fin Fish Free. And this was also a bill introduced by um, Congressman Young to make it so that we could not have, so there would not be fish farming, fin fish farming off of Alaska waters in the EEE zone. The U.S. Coast Guard mask mandate. This would be funny if it wasn't um, so upsetting. Recently, the White House put out an executive order um, saying that all people on vessels would need to be wearing a mask at all times, um, even while sleeping in their bunks. We later found out that they meant this was only for passenger vessels. However, um, nothing has come out from the CDC, the White House, or any or the U.S. Coast Guard um, saying that we are officially exempt. So we're still waiting on that. Our delegation is actively working on it, as are we. And then the Young Fishermen's Development Act. This is an act that was actually passed last year. Um, right now, we're trying to get money into that grant. And what it's going to allow is to help train and mentor young fishermen to get them into the business. The Aqua Act. This is Senator Wickers, who is trying to um, do more in promotion of um, far fish farming in the United States. We are, we've been very engaged on this bill. We are asking for an Alaska opt out because we do not want fin fish farming. We don't have as much of a problem with the shellfish and mariculture, but definitely fin fish farming is something that we do not want to see coming into our waters. And last but not least, we also do a lot of federal work with the EPA regarding pebble mine. And I realized I just crammed a lot of information in there and I spoke very fast. So if you have any questions about any of these legislative issues that we are tracking and you've got more questions about them, I'm always happy to um, talk to you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Francis. Our third panelist is Chris Barrows, Executive Director of the Pacific Seafood Processors Association. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Scott. And uh, thank you to Commonwealth North uh, for having me today and uh, appreciate uh, being, being here amongst the panelists uh, that we have. Um, appreciate the technical support here putting up uh, the slide deck um, as well. Okay, well, I, um, so I'm gonna per start uh, by identifying um, a little bit about who PSPA is, uh, where we, we, we operate, uh, perhaps a little bit more details on uh, how we're an economic driver and, and seafood in general is an economic driver to the state of Alaska. Uh, break that down a little bit into in terms of details regarding what that means for investments uh, to the state from our sector. And uh, 
uh, and then uh, highlight some of the risks to our sector that we see going forward. Uh, so with that, next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, uh, Pacific Seafood Processors Association is a nonprofit seafood trade association. We're a group of eight seafood processing companies uh, with operations in 15 communities across Alaska. And uh, as an association, we've been in place since 1914 and operating uh, company with companies operating in Alaska uh, since before that time. Uh, our focus as an association is both on statewide and federal uh, management policy and regulatory issues that are common issues amongst our, our member companies. And we work closely with, uh, 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 with organizations, specifically uh, UFA and, and, and Francis. Um, so all of the topics that she just mentioned from Board of Fish to, to uh, the uh, uh, budget for Alaska Department of Fish and Game, to the legislative initiatives that are before the legislature right now, and also those uh, federal um, uh, items that she mentioned. We're, we're heavily involved in uh, communicating and uh, uh, weighing in on those two in, in partnership with UFA and others around the state. So, uh, but as, as companies for, for PSBA, our member companies, they, they purchase, process, and market hundreds of millions of pounds of salmon, pollock, crab, cod, halibut, and other species of Alaska seafood. And they've made large capital investments in the communities in which they operate. They provide thousands of direct and indirect jobs and markets for thousands of commercial fishermen, uh, and uh, they contribute to millions of dollars in tax revenues. And I'll go into more detail about that in a, in a couple more slides. So these companies play a vital role in the economics of the region. Um, and uh, with that, next slide, please. Here's a little bit more detail, uh, not just for PSPA companies, but for uh, the processing sector in general. This is specifically focused on the Alaska inshore seafood processing. Uh, and this map shows the location of approximately 85 shoreside facilities in Alaska, which process a minimum of 100,000 pounds of seafood annually. So there are some, some processors that uh, process less than that, which are not reflected in the map. As you can see, there's quite a, a large and wide geographic range for this sector across coastal communities of the state. Uh, this also includes roughly about 10 floating processors processors that operate in multiple locations, uh, typically throughout, a, throughout the year. Um, and these floating processors are often supported by shoreside processing infrastructure. Next slide, please. So um, this slide is uh, benefit uh, or courtesy of ASME. And um, uh, I don't wanna replicate what, what Jeremy already mentioned, but I, I did like this and, and wanted to, to highlight it to, to show graphically uh, where the seafood uh, goes throughout the world globally uh, from Alaska. I think it's a good visual. And even though the U.S. is still our single largest market, about one third of Alaska products uh, uh, is distributed and marketed in the United States, the largest market for some of our, and that's the largest market for some of our salmon, cod, and pollock products. In the typical year, about two thirds of our, our Alaska seafood is exported. Um, so this definitely uh, shows the global trend. Um, and opening up more markets and diverse markets for Alaska seafood is one of the keys to increasing the value that we can bring back um, to Alaska. Next slide, please. So uh, uh, this is just a, a bit of a transition slide. I wanted to highlight that the value of Alaska seafood uh, provides for the state and local revenues that were uh, a, a revenue, uh, excuse me, a renewable economic driver across the state. And, and the key takeaway in these next couple slides is that from a commercial fishery standpoint, we, we pay more in state taxes than it costs the state to manage uh, 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 their resources. And, and um, uh, that'll be reflected here uh, a little bit later in, in the next couple slides. Next slide, please. So this is, apologize for the busyness of this, but this kind of highlights uh, from a budget perspective uh, where um, uh, a lot of the, the revenue goes. Um, uh, seafood pays for approximately $172 million in taxes, fees, and self-assessments to fund fisheries management each year. And that's uh, a little bit different than what's on the slide, but that's updated figures from 2018. Um, the revenue is more than four times the state's general fund uh, revenue used by the Commercial Fisheries Division of Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So that's approximately uh, $38 million, which is the uh, fiscal year 20 uh, final enacted. Um, the seafood uh, revenue pays directly into the general fund um, and supports both state and, and local governments. And here, uh, next slide, please. This is an example of uh, that uh, 
funding revenue from the perspective of distribution to a number of different fishing communities across the state. So uh, this shows revenue to, um, uh, again, 2008 numbers to, to these particular uh, communities. And as you can see, these revenues are significant uh, for, for, for these communities. Next slide, please. So we directly employ uh, more workers than any other private sector industry in Alaska. Uh, I think this gets to one of the questions that I saw pop up um, uh, between Jeremy and, and uh, uh, Francis's slide as well. Uh, you can see that uh, of the uh, almost 57,000 direct jobs, um, uh, 23,000 are, are directly uh, uh, focused on Alaska residents where they're uh, or directly employ, employing Alaska residents. Um, and this is just on the seafood uh, uh, processor side of the house. So Alaska fisheries, um, the, 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 unlike other industries, um, the resource in and of itself is not managed to maximize revenue, uh, but it's managed to biological yield. Um, and that's significant because those yields is what translates into these economic employment opportunities um, and supporting this community health uh, revenue and, and other objectives. And that's actually built in directly into uh, the federal management principles uh, that uh, are reflected both at, at, from a federal management and state management perspective. Next slide, please. Here's a little more detail on how that's distributed throughout the state, again, from a, a seafood processing standpoint. Um, these numbers represent direct jobs in, in, in uh, excuse me, both in harvesting and processing. And we employ more workers than any other private sector in Alaska. Um, uh, including the multiplier flex, it's the third largest private sector job creator in Alaska after the oil, oil and gas and tourism industries. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, one of the economic benefits uh, uh, that uh, uh, has been spoken about before, but I think it's worth um, um, highlighting and, and continuing to be aware of, is that of the uh, uh, billions of pounds of, of, of seafood process, the industry um, ships a lot of that uh, south every year uh, from Alaska. And uh, this allows for more competitive rates on northbound freight because uh, they were able to fill up empty cargo volume and cargo holds going south. Um, so in the northbound freight uh, rates, obviously Alaska's are, are dependent upon that for a lot of importation of different products and, and uh, uh, needs. So this it, overall, from a transportation standpoint, this, this, uh, our, our sector helps translate into lower cost for groceries building supplies, other types of consumable goods like that for Alaskans. Uh, the infrastructure and support services geared toward the seafood industry also support non-fishing related activities, uh, both in coastal communities and, and across the state. And statewide, the, the processing sector, uh, sector spends about, um, uh, spends millions of dollars. In 2016, it was uh, identified around $17 million flying workers throughout Alaska. And I, I suspect uh, for, for last year, given the amount of flying that needed to take place for uh, COVID-related safe transit type of opportunities um, uh, that, uh, that may be even higher um, uh, last year. So these dollars are critical to maintaining rural air routes um, for the communities that we operate in um, and other businesses. Next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned that uh, we primarily, uh, many of the companies operate off the road system uh, in rural areas in the state. We have high cost that translates into high cost of fuel, um, high cost of transportation, and uh, 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 and we're we're shipping or we're we're taking delivery of and and processing and, and bringing to market a perishable product. So uh, time is of the essence, and and uh, the infrastructure is of the essence in terms of being able to do that in in, in an appropriate way. There's a significant risk associated with uh, with these operations and high capital needs. Uh, in many cases, our companies are creating their own energy um, uh, uh, facilities. Uh, waste disposal facilities, uh, and they pay and use the bulk of, of, of the utilities um, in that regard. Um, so these companies have tremendous long-term investments. Uh, they are in it for the long haul, um, and they continually try to increase the values of Alaska seafood. And the next couple slides will go into uh, how they, we go about uh, trying to do that through sustainable management, marketing, and uh, also production. Next slide, please. On the sustainable management front, uh, it, it, it costs money to uh, sustainably manage, again, the resource that is, is what we're trying to manage here, so that we need to, uh, we need to fish near, near what we call optimum yield to be able to pay for that. Um, there's core management projects, uh, like uh, Francis mentioned, uh, that uh, uh, through uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game and also through NOAA at the federal level that need to be funded. Um, less data translates into, uh, oftentimes translates into more conservative uh, scientific 
uh, 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 results or, or decisions uh, that have the, the possibility of, res of resulting into conservative management decisions. So fewer in, in, in the ADF and G context, fewer in-season management projects means the potential for less fish to be harvested, which means less tax revenue. Um, we need to maintain federal uh, level funding for marine surveys at, uh, again with NOAA, those stock assessments that support management um, on in federal waters. And uh, both the, these, these surveys of both the federal and state standpoint are fundamental to the basis for biologically sound uh, management systems that can support uh, fisheries uh, sustainably and uh, uh, into the future. So we continue to advocate and a large portion of our advocacy, of our, our advocacy both in the state and federal level is to maintain these scientific uh, based systems. Uh, so the, another element of um, uh, sustainable management is in uh, uh, the marketing side of the house, being able to get product to market. And that uh, deals with the sustainability certification, uh, which is another investment that the industry uh, invests in. Uh, it's absolutely necessary in most markets um, and more because more and more markets are requiring basically independent third party uh, certif uh, certifiers um, that look through uh, the entire management process harvesting and, uh, and processing uh, uh, operations to certify that the product is being sustainably sourced. And this can be expensive and burdensome, uh, but it's important uh, to be able to uh, uh, access uh, markets and, and uh, 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 support uh, the wise decisions by the, from the consumer standpoint. Um, keeping Alaska seafood as a premium brand and extracting a higher value depends not on depends on not undermining these types of management systems that have brought us to the point where we are now. Uh, next slide please. So investments in in marketing, uh, I touched on a, a bit on that in terms of that a segue from the last slide. How do we compete? Uh, we do that through investing in new product development. Um, we, we, we do that also through uh, supporting uh, the, the work and the uh, initiatives from, the, um, from ASME and Jeremy's uh, uh, and his staff. Um, uh, so we, we, it's really important that we motivate uh, and uh, utilize these mechanisms to be able to tell the Alaska story. Um, and uh, that, that helps us again, uh, get market share in the different areas globally that would that our uh, Alaska seafood is is uh, being distributed to. Next slide, please. So investments also re are required in terms of the production. Uh, that includes, we're talking about equipment, technology, and infrastructure. These costs include shipping, fuel, construction, uh, air transportation, um, and utilities. So in uh, uh, I think I'll, I'll leave that there. I think we've hit, hit that a little bit um, uh, hard already. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, what puts these, some of these investments at risk is, uh, uh, is a list of issues here. What I, Jeremy already sp spoke to some trade, market, and consumer preference aspects. Uh, I know that Stephanie's gonna get more into the trade policy in her presentation. So I'd like to uh, focus on uh, um, uh, one specific additional uh, uh, risk for our investments, uh, which is, next slide, please, COVID-19. And uh, it, uh, as, as Francis mentioned, there was a, a huge effort across industry in partnership with the state uh, um, to uh, both take advantage or, or to, to be able to maintain safe operations from the, pers from the pursuit of fisheries uh, seasons um, all throughout the year. Um, and that, uh, that, that only happened based on the strong partnership and coordination with uh, uh, particularly elements in the state of Alaska administration from the Unified Command and Department of Health and, and Social Services. Um, we continue uh, in 2021, uh, we find that uh, and, and, and looking forward that 2021 is, 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 is going to be uh, even harder in some respects um, based on widespread community spread and the increasing number of variants that um, are gonna continue to challenge being able to deal with, with the pandemic uh, into this next year. Uh, one of the things that we see on the horizon um, is access to vaccines. So we're very happy that the state of Alaska was able to uh, open up uh, vaccines. I think that there, in fact, uh, today, I just saw an announcement that uh, the state is going to uh, uh, phase 1C for vaccine distribution. So the, the fact that increased uh, supply is, is happening throughout the nation, that, that uh, Alaska is getting that portion, and that they're able to uh, now target and, and focus on 
uh, what we call frontline essential workers that, that exist both in the harvesting and the processing side to be able to get vaccinations into arms for, for our uh, workers. That, that's going to be a huge game changer, we hope, for um, in 2021. Uh, so with that, next slide, please. Thank you for your attention and uh, appreciate it. And I will stay on to answer any questions after the next. I can learn. Well, thanks, Chris. Our, uh, our final speaker today is Stephanie Madsen. Stephanie is executive director of the At Sea Processors Association. After her remarks, we will take questions from the audience. As a reminder, audience members may submit questions via the Zoom chat window, or you can text it to 907-230-230. 2284. Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you. Unmute, Stephanie. Yeah, I was worried about the slides and heck, I can't even get myself off mute. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the opportunity, uh, one at end, Commonwealth North. Um, you know, I've spent my whole career in the seafood industry, so I appreciate the recognition recognition that we are an economic driver uh, here in Alaska. Uh, I really appreciate my colleagues uh, today uh, to kind of team things up here. Uh, we do work very collaboratively. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, the way that the seafood industry does work together. So I'm going to start to just to let you know, well, who is the At Sea Processors Association? Uh, we're a trade association of, of six uh, companies that own and operate great 15 catcher processor vessels up in the Bering Sea uh, and off the coast of Oregon and Washington in the Pacific uh, Hake fishery. Our vessels are, are primarily a Pollock producing vessel, a little bit of cod uh, and a little bit of yellowfin, but without Pollock uh, we wouldn't exist. I would note that um, we are partners or uh, owners uh, of the Western Alaska uh, CDQ groups are either partners or owners of, of many of our vessels and companies. So we do um, have a broad impact uh, in Alaska. This is what uh, people really think about when they think about Pollock. Um, it is a cousin to cod. It's the largest fishery in the United States and it's the largest certified sustainable fishery in the world. Um, as you can see below, we are certified by the Marine Stewardship Council, as well as the Alaska RFM program. So we're pretty proud of that. Uh, we're a federal fishery. And I think looking at some of the questions, uh, people might be confused about the stats. And I think that when you listen to the economic value of the fisheries, there, there really isn't a differentiation between state fisheries and federal fisheries. Uh, in many of ASME's um, data. And that's primarily because uh, Alaska is unique that our federal fisheries only occur off of one state. Uh, that is unique uh, of the eight regional councils. So there isn't uh, really a delineation. So for Pollock, there is one state water fishery up in Prince William Sound. All the other Pollock fisheries that you will hear about are federal fisheries. So they take place from three to 200 miles. We have two federal observers and we are pretty regulated. We have flow scales. Now, we are moving to away from uh, the typical markets that you see. Uh, one of the leaders in uh, the Pollock industry, Mr. Bundren, he always, uh, actually, I think it's on his emails. Uh, and so I uh, stole this. Our goal is for more people eating more wild Alaska Pollock in more ways, more often globally. So that's our goal. And as you can see, um, whoops, we are trying to expand the uh, types of products that Pollock can be used of. We have a sister organization that handles that for us. It's called the Genu Genuine Alaska Pollock Producers. So today I thought I'd focus on some of the trade challenges. Certainly though, COVID is huge. I mean, one of my companies <clears throat> told me the other day that they anticipate spending $30 million in 2021. That's one company in 2021. So as you can imagine, trade becomes more important since 
the 30 million that I just spoke of comes out cash flow, bottom line. So having these trade challenges really do make it more difficult. Um, I know there's a lot of writing on this, so I'm gonna leave it up there for a while so you can read it. But I think the bottom line is that these are not new. We've had re uh, retaliatory tariffs from China uh, since 2018. Um, so it's, it, it's, it's ongoing. Um, there has been a great growth in China, but we have not been able to take advantage of that given uh, the trade war with China. And then I think the bottom line is that the last bullet. Meanwhile, uh, key categories of seafood such as pollock continue to enter the United States from China duty-free. I should have started out letting you know that fair access to export markets really is a critical priority. We've long advocated for the elimination of barriers to global seafood trade, um, but that just hasn't happened. So the next one is China. Uh, we were pretty hopeful uh, when the Trump administration uh, introduced a phase one trade agreement in 2019. But quite frankly, that agreement has failed to deliver any market access uh, or any gains whatsoever for seafood. Um, trade uh, tariffs are up, are up to 10.5%. They continue to be imposed. Um, and additionally, there are other non-trade barriers um, that have also hampered certain species. Uh, it's very complex. It's difficult to pry apart. It's not exciting. So it's difficult to get our, you know, delegation, although I will tell you the Alaska delegation has been engaged and have been big supporters. Um, but it's nuanced and detailed. So it's, it's not a, you know, a quick soundbite, as you can see from my slides. European Union. Um, we continue to be subject to substantial tariffs in addition to something that they call quotas uh, over there. So, you know, they have cer certain quotas and if you get in before that quota, you might be okay. If you are too late or your season is different, uh, it, it is a big, a big impact. As you can see from the rest of the, the printed uh, material, I really have provided here um, other species that are quite frankly more impacted than pollock in the European Union. Uh, we've been pretty successful with the, the tariff quotas, uh, but as you can see, uh, ski, sea scallops, uh, lobster, uh, probably our crab, um, there have been big, huge impacts and continue. Russia, well, we can pretty much guess where we are with Russia. Uh, since 2013, imports to Russia have been We lost you, Stephanie. For Pollock. Um, Pollock, um, we have, we're direct competitors. We used to be uh, a little bit of uh, a premier because we had the Marine Stewardship Council certification and that helped in the marketplace. But Russia has managed to uh, get that certification. So the uh, premium is now gone. United Kingdom, I think people already mentioned Brexit. Um, it's kind of yet to be seen how that will all play out. But again, uh, this is an example where we pay duties going in. When they send it over here, they come duty free. So you can imagine how frustrating it might be for companies like ours. I think one of the trade challenges that we're trying to address, as I mentioned, is geographic indicators. Uh, we were successful in the United States changing the name of the Alaska Pollock to Pollock. So the only people that can use Alaska pollock now are people that harvest it in Alaska. So no longer can Russia use the term Alaska pollock in the United States. We're gonna try to fix that in the European Union too. 
little bit um, more difficult, but we have a, uh, made those applications and we're hoping that uh, we can get that. It is a heavy lift though, but it would be a great benefit to be able to sell and for the consumer, quite frankly, to know that when they see Alaska Pollock, it truly is Alaska Pollock and not Russian Pollock. You know, if you look at all of these slides and you take them together, it's pretty obviously obvious that there's a deeply unbalanced seafood trade landscape. And that landscape is an enormous threat to the US industry's competitiveness and really the long-term viability of many employers in our sector. Belatedly recognizing this late in the game, the previous administration established a seafood trade task force, which was charged with developing a comprehensive national seafood trade strategy. But unfortunately, that strategy was never publicly released or implemented. So we're still nowhere. Um, again, I'm, I'm just gonna stop here because I bet you there's gonna be lots of questions. Um, and this is our companies and look forward to the questions. Hope we did okay there on time. I think you're just fine. Well, thanks, Stephanie. And on behalf of uh, Commonwealth North, I wanna thank all of our guest speakers for joining us and for their presentations. Juanetta, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, we do. Um, let me... All right. Um, let's start with, uh, let me just remark that we are at one o'clock and I, I know that some people may have to leave us. We will uh, record the, the question and answer session and um, if you're able to catch up with it later, if, if uh, you do have a conflict, we certainly understand. Um, let me start with this question. Um, I just I have a curiosity just based on Stephanie's last statement with regard to the National Seafood Strategy. Um, were you able to review any draft form of that and what's the Alaska industry's uh, position on what it may or may not contain? Uh, Juanetta, um, to my knowledge, we've never, we never saw a draft before the Trump administration exited. I don't know whether the Biden administration team will pick it up as a guidepost. It's yet to be seen. Um, we do know that the USTR rep, um, I believe, has been confirmed, uh, Catherine Tay, uh, and so many of us will be, uh, well, I think many of us have already sent her a congratulatory letter with all of the things that I just put on these slides, so to prepare her. Um, and then I think we're going to have to, you know, uh, uh, try to arrange meetings with our CEOs and have them in there explaining the, the damage that has been done by the trade policies. So we're hopeful, um, but you know, it's, it's not rocket science to think that these things don't happen quickly. And as I think uh, Jeremy mentioned, seafood is just one component of these trade negotiations. We got hung up with uh, the European Union because of the Harley Davidson uh, purchase. So, uh, but thanks to our congressional delegation, let me give them another shout out. They have uh, pushed to make seafood a higher priority within the administration. And we're hopeful that the new Biden administration will also take heed to that. Sure. Um, well, I also noted from Francis's presentation uh, with regard to the Magnuson-Stevens Act reauthorization that it's being led by a Massachusetts congressman. And uh, that's, I mean, I'm sure our delegation will be engaged in that process. Uh, but I think it's the first time in, is it 40 years maybe that um, we haven't had an Alaskan uh, delegation member at the, at, at least leading or co-leading the process. Is that correct? Well, Jared Huffman is actually a congressman from California. Okay. Sorry. So um, he does have commercial fishermen there in California. Um, and yes, it would be lovely if we did have um, an Alaska delegate, you know, spearheading this. Um, but Congressman Young is very involved and um, you know, tries to work with Congressman Huffman, and the best that we can ask for is to be able to keep the lines of communication open. Um, I think we've done that with Congressman Huffman. He knows we're here, he's been responsive to us, and he seems very eager to hear what we have to say. So that, that is a plus. Great. 
Well, Nana, just, just if I might add a, a comment, thankfully it hasn't been 40 years. I think Senator Stevens in 2008 uh, was the last real, 2007 or 2008, finally reauthorized it. And that you are correct. That That's the last time it was reauthorized and we certainly had a, a great leader. Uh, we're hopeful that Senator Sullivan and Senator Cantwell uh, certainly understand our region um, and will uh, advocate for us uh, if, if Congressman Huffman is not conducive to our views. All right. Um, you know, uh, the discussion about how things have shifted uh, since the advent of COVID, and um, even though the amount of Alaska seafood headed to China um, may have been on the decline in recent years, there still has been a significant amount of uh, Alaska seafood um, in the last 20 years or so that has ended up in China for reprocessing and then um, going back to both U.S. and other markets. Um, do you have any indication from uh, the processing side, uh, either Stephanie or Chris, uh, or I guess, well, Jeremy or Francis, anybody who hasn't uh, thought on this, about reworking global supply chains uh, as a result of COVID and as a result of uh, some of the recent trade actions um, to maybe diversify supply chains a little bit more. Who wants well, that? Do you want uh, me to take a stab? Uh, well, so I guess I'll start, Jeremy, okay. but you and Chris uh, know more about this. I think one, from a Pollock perspective, and I'm sorry to be so Pollock-centric, but that that is my life these days. Um, there's very little Pollock that is reprocessed in China and brought back. Um, the damage that's done to Pollock fishery um, basically is the expansion of the China markets. I think we had at least one company that was well positioned to expand their uh, markets in, in a great way and that, that got shut down. Um, I do just wanna also make a plug here that there is no concern about COVID relative to packaging. Uh, or, or frozen product. And Jeremy and Chris Barrows and NFI have been making sure that that is loud and clear. Yeah, I, I can talk a little bit about the, the China markets um, and why it was an important market. To, you know, I think just the easiest stat to throw out for everybody is that the, the middle class in China is the size of the entire United States. And so th there's a lot of buying power and demand in China. Um, and actually, I would say prior to the trade war, U.S. goods were very favorably viewed in China as well, because Chinese consumers, frankly, knew that our, 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 our regulations were more strict and stringent and probably produced better products and, and safer consumer goods. Um, you know, th this is where we always get to play the Alaska card. Um, you know, as we all know, when we go across the world, we whip out our, our driver's license. I'm from Alaska and people go, oh, OK, come on in. And we get to do that a little bit in, in um, foreign markets as well, is because Alaska sometimes gets a different differentiation in the consumer marketplace, too. And so that's a benefit. But just the barrier of getting in, we're losing that market and other products are filling that void. Um, we look at imports from such as Norwegian farm salmon into China in the last several years, and they just continue to grow um, year over year where, we're, where our, our foot um, space in that market is shrinking. Um, I can tell you the seafood industry wants to be in China, though it's very difficult to be in there right now, and we are looking at other markets. And ASME is expanding our marketing portfolio to help respond to the industry's needs. We're looking at other areas in Southeast Asia for reprocessing, but also for consumer market. We're looking at South America. There's opportunity in South America to expand seafood sales as well as reprocessing. And, and I think if anything that's been you know noted that that's, we've noticed is while it took us 20 years to get into the China market, we maybe had a little bit too eggs in one too many eggs in one basket there. And it is important to diversify where we send our seafood. And that helps keep global competition up as well, which helps bring the value of our seafood up. Thanks. Chris, any thoughts from the shoreside sector? I think uh, Jeremy uh, uh, summarized that quite well. Um, so I'll, 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 um, I don't have anything else to add. He did a great job. Okay. All right. Um, we have a question, a couple of questions from Marcus Hartley. Um, do uh, uh, what are, uh, this uh, again, specifically to Chris, uh, what did the shore-based processors think about the North Pacific Fishery Management Council to close down the EEZ fishery in Cook Inlet? And how do you think that's going to affect the salmon industry in the long run? 
Uh, well, it certainly affects those uh, commercial fishers that are that uh, harvest from from that particular region. Um, I'll, I'll say this is a bit of a complicated issue that has a, a long history uh, to it. Uh, some court cases that resulted in forcing uh, the decision uh, that, uh, uh, that 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 the council had to make, um, um, you know, just recently. So, but I, I don't think that's the end of the story. There's a lot of effort that's going on. Um, PSPA is is supportive with. Uh, with UFA and with, with others around the state, including with the, the state of Alaska, uh, in um, talking to our delegations and developing a way to be able to create a federal fix in the Magnuson-Stevens Act. So uh, to, to, to Francis's point in terms of, we fundamentally absolutely love the Magnuson-Stevens Act the way it is. We think it's well-structured. We think it's provided a, a good foundation for uh, the management processes that uh, and the successes that we've been able to achieve here in, in, in Alaska and in our fisheries. Uh, but uh, this is one area where we're, we're maybe the, um, uh, a federal fix that allows, particularly in this context, for a state to be able to manage, um, uh, uh, manage a, a resource that, that Fun, that, that right now is required to be managed through the council process. And that's, that's why the decision was made. Um, but um, hopefully they'll be able to have a legislative fix at the federal level to be able to put that back in the state of Alaska as a management control. Um, we, we have a number of questions actually about uh, climate change and sustainability. And um, uh, Marcus has added a, a question here as well about, uh, you know, what is the Alaska seafood industry going to be doing to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions? And uh, what, what are some efforts? Uh, we, we do have some uh, state loan programs for energy efficiency, but uh, are there other incentives or measures that the state government can make? Um, and how do you think the industry will be responding to this um, uh, very rapid and uh, significant uh, approach that the Biden administration is making towards uh, climate change measures and reduction of greenhouse gases. Anybody want to jump in on that? <laughs> I, I'll go ahead and start, but I hope my other colleagues uh, jump in here. I guess uh, where to start, Marcus? Um, I guess from a carbon emissions, um, you know, we are, in, some of the vessels are being replaced. And certainly when those vessels get replaced, there are uh, attention paid, not only because of the importance of it, because of money, um, you know, to change that. I would add though that Pollock, uh, the Pollock fishery, well, there's gonna be a report come out fairly soon. We probably have one of the lowest carbon footprints um, of all, uh, all fisheries, believe it or not. Um, uh, so we, we are gonna start promoting that. Um, from a climate perspective, you know, I, I think we're pretty well positioned here in the North Pacific. Uh, the North Pacific has been a leader in ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, we need to continue to advocate for funding uh, climate research and uh, specifically the surveys, because uh, all of the, the all that map modeling relies on surveys. Um, we have a fisheries ecosystem plan in the Bering Sea that has a climate module uh, to look at what the gaps are and 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 how we would incorporate uh, that resilience into management actions. Um, I guess I know that climate is changing rapidly, but from the public perspective, um, we really haven't seen yet our footprint change uh, to where we're finding Pollock. I think primarily that is because of the food hasn't really moved yet. Um, we do uh, uh, see movement up to the Northern Bering Sea, but quite frankly, we've also seen it move back. I think that's temperature dependent. And as we get the cold pool, um, you know, it kind of comes back to normal. But I do uh, think that industry is obviously paying attention. Uh, we're paying attention to the Biden administration, you know, EOs. Uh, one is out for public comment right now. Uh, so we'll be paying attention, but I I'm obviously biased, but I'm pretty proud of the work we've done up here. And I think we've, uh, done a lot of work to position ourselves uh, in a very, very good way. I can go next. Um, you know, 
carbon footprint and emissions, um, you know, that would fall under for UFA are environmental and climate change category. And it's definitely something that is a priority of ours. And we do know that fishermen are very interested in um, learning more about it and ways that they can help um, reduce their carbon footprint. Um, just this morning, I got a telephone call from a gentleman in Southeast wanting to know more about the Diesel Emissions Reductions Act, um, which right now is available. The EPA is accepting applications. Um, it's approximately $46 million in competitive grant funding. Um, so I can put that link there so you can read more about it. But it's definitely on the newer side, I would say, and one that we're, you know, we're just all, you know, I'm eager to look for to look into it and start sharing information, but it is it all it is all still very new, and so um, just one of those things that we're going to have to hopefully um, jump on board with and and start promoting. Um, and UFA will do a really um, put out a really big effort to alert the fleet about opportunities um, to do this, and we also hold a lot of webinars, so this could very well be a webinar that UFA could sponsor to talk about ways to reduce carbon footprint. Chris, anything from the shore side sector you wanna throw in on that? Um, well, I, we're, we're involved in the, um, um, yeah, yes, there is. So the, we're, we're involved in the efforts that uh, Stephanie mentioned uh, with regard to uh, identifying what the, the greenhouse gas uh, emission uh, target levels are. And um, I, there's some studies underway, like she mentioned, and I. I mean, from, from what I'm seeing in, in those, I, 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 I suspect there's going to be a very good news story that comes out of that, uh, particularly in relationship to other types of proteins. Um, and uh, uh, so I'm looking forward to, to, uh, uh, to that being something that, that uh, continues to evolve, continues to uh, have more details on. Um, the, uh, and being able to share, share that when, and, and discuss that when, when those come out. I, I think uh, part of the issue is uh, related back to a bill that's before that 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 uh, Francis mentioned, which is the, uh, the seafood development uh, tax credit, uh, Senate Bill thirty three. So reinvestment in um, uh, in product lines uh, not only helps with being more efficient and being able to create different types of products, but but. But that efficiency um, also translates into uh, energy utilization and, and different things like that. So an increase in investments in the infrastructure of, of the plants, um, uh, will that, that efficiency won't just be a bottom line issue, but it also, I, I think, will have energy consequences as well in a positive context. Okay, great. Jeremy, did you have anything you wanted to throw in on that at all? No, no, I think my colleagues did a great job. Perfect. Well, let's let's talk about the elephant in the room then. Um, we have a, a question from uh, Steve, uh, and I apologize, I'm going to mask your last name. Is it uh, Veno or Thino? Uh, and really what his, the crux of Steve's question, and uh, Francis and Jeremy have, have uh, typed in some answers in the answer panel uh, that I'll refer the audience to as well. But um, really the crux of the question here is, is that, it is the return on investment in terms of $172 million in tax revenue, is that a reasonable rate of, of return for the state of Alaska uh, with regard to a, a $2 billion valued uh, ex vessel value um, uh, fishery, fisheries? So is that a reasonable rate of return? Well, yes, I, I think it is because, I, you know, Again, I, I think that um, that number is very large, but you have to remember that that's all the way out to 200 miles. That's not just state fisheries. The federal fisheries do pay a landing tax uh, and we do contribute to ASME. So those numbers that you see are also federal uh, contributions. Um, but when you talk about state management of federal fisheries, there's very little cost. And so, that, that number about the value of the fishery relative to payment to the state for management purposes is a little kind of wacky because the state of Alaska has very little management responsibilities for the federal fisheries. And then of course, from a federal fisheries perspective, we are paying landing tax uh, as well as the ASME tax. And so I, I would say that we, we are uh, paying a, a, good, a, a good share of that. Um, and, and paying our, our share. I, I, don't, I don't think it's 
you know, if this, then that, I, I don't think you can make those direct uh, links uh, in my view. Thanks, Stephanie. And yeah, I would say, I'll repeat what I said during my presentation, the um, $172 million is more than four times what it costs to run the Division of Commercial Fisheries through the Department of Fish and Game. So that means not only are we paying for the management of our fisheries um, via the state, we are also giving um, extra money to the general fund that the state of Alaska can do with what it wants. And aside from landing taxes, we also pay hatcheries. Um, so hatcheries um, are mostly funded by commercial fishermen. Um, and so it's, it's very much, um, that, that's a, it does seem 172 um, based on the billions that we do um, bring in gross. Um, seems like a small number, but it is actually quite a significant amount um, when you factor in all the other taxes and landing fees that we pay and just how little it actually costs to manage our fisheries. So I think it's a fair number for sure. Chris, did you want to say? Yeah, I, 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 of course, I agree with Stephanie and, and what Francis said. And, and I think that, um, you, you know, there's it, it one of the things Stephanie mentioned, um, I, I think is critical here because uh, um, like every pro problem, uh, every question, first of all, I think it's a great question. But the way that you go about trying to trying to uh, dissect it and look at it um, uh, kind of puts different filters on the final answer that, that you're going to get. Um, so. Uh, from the perspective, this is a public resource, um, it, but uh, it, it's not enough just to say that and then to look at the volume um, and the, the, the value that comes out of that and say, well, you know, are we getting enough of a percentage on that, on that uh, what is inherently a, a, a public resource? Um, because you need to take into account the costs, the investment, the infrastructure, everything that I mentioned in, in, in my presentation and, and was uh, um, highlighted in, in, in some of the others, um, so one of the ways to look at this, I, I think that that provides a little bit better perspective of the uh, responding to an answer that yes, this is a good return on investment. Is looking at it from the from the standpoint that the state spends about 38 million or so uh, to get close to 60,000 jobs in uh, in the state, and a return on investment of about 172 million, and lots and lots of other types of indirect economic activity. So if you're looking at it that way, it's an absolutely bang for the buck, great return on investment that the state is getting out of, out of this particular industry. One that I would add too, that some of the federal fisheries, they pay cost recovery to the US government. Mm -hmm. So those are federal fisheries. Um, and if you have a, it, it's more of a, a quota share program, they do, uh, they do also pay cost recovery in addition to the landing taxes to the state of Alaska. And the landing taxes and the, the taxes that Francis and others are, are speaking to, that is for fish and game, but there's also a Department of Public Safety. We fund our portion of that. Um, you know, some of the other uh, entities in the, in the state government we also cover those costs as well. So it's not just the management of the fisheries, but it's Department of Public Safety, DEC. We recognize there's cost to that. And that money also covers those costs. So just wanted to add that. Great, thanks. Um, well, let's, uh, we're, we're uh, way over time and I appreciate everybody's indulgence. I'm gonna just ask one additional question. I'll uh, ask this of Jeremy. You mentioned the tremendous growth in um, e-commerce uh, for uh, seafood uh, as a result of the pandemic. And can you characterize that a little bit more? Uh, what sort of channels, uh, e-commerce channels is that moving into? Is it um, uh, retail to e-tail kinds of uh, movement? Is it fishermen direct or is it um, uh, like the dinner, the, the uh, doorstep dinner programs? What kind of activity are you seeing there in e-commerce? Right, well, well, I would say all of the above. Um, I think it's also important to point out that the U.S. is way behind other countries or other regions in the world in e-commerce. Um, many Asian countries are way ahead. Um, if you want to just point out China alone, China calls uh, 
shopping at a, at a grocery store, offline shopping. They're so far ahead of, of e-commerce than, than we are that they, they, it's almost embarrassing. Um, so e-commerce is also, you know, so we're catching up and still learning how we want to shop as consumers in the U.S. e-commerce. Um, but where we're seeing a lot of growth is uh, a lot of direct to consumer. And what's also great about this is frozen sales. Um, frozen, is, uh, frozen seafood is a lot, a lot of ways more sustainable. There's less waste. Um, it's more convenient for consumers because they can thaw it out and cook it when they want to uh, at, at their own convenience. So um, it's a really great movement for seafood and for Alaska seafood. So the direct sales from, say, a processor or, a, 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 I guess, a second dairy wholesaler um, are happening. We're, we're also seeing a lot of growth in um in, in e-commerce sites like Amazon Fresh, where you're not just buying seafood, but you're also buying other items that go into your, your pantry at home. And where for ASME, where we really love this opportunity is we can advertise recipes in Amazon Fresh. And so, and so we call these clickable recipes and you go, oh, I like that recipe. You click add ingredients, all the ingredients go into your cart, you hit purchase and either depending on what market you're in later that afternoon, you might have dinner, uh, all the ingredients you need to prepare dinner plus the recipes right there for you. So it's a really great opportunity. We're also seeing growth in the, the meal delivery services um, such as uh, um, HelloFresh or everybody's familiar with Blue Apron. Um, Blue Apron's had, had, had some changes over time because once again, these e-commerce sites are also learning how to, to market to U.S. Uh, customers that are, that are trying to figure this out as they go as well. And so there's, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of growth. I think we're going to see more changes in the coming year um, as people, you know, emerge from their holes of the pandemic and figure out, you know, how much e-commerce do they want and how much do they want to continue to, to frequent their favorite restaurant that might be open again. Well, God willing, we'll be out of our holes soon. <laughs> so, all right. Well, uh, thank you, panel, for your time and your indulgence. Uh, uh, appreciate your uh, additional time going over. And to the audience that stayed with us, and let me go back to Scott for any closing comments. Scott? Okay, well, thanks. Um, I just again want to thank our panelists today, uh, Jeremy Woodrow, Francis Leach, Chris Barrows, and Stephanie Madsen. I want to thank uh, our members and friends for joining us today. If you're not yet a member, I encourage you to become a member of Commonwealth North at www.commonwealthnorth.org. Lastly, we invite you to join us for our next program, Alaska's Outdoor Recreation Sector, on March 17th at noon. We will present a panel of speakers to describe the economic impact of the outdoor recreation sector, look at several rapidly growing components of this sector, and identify the opportunities and barriers for the industry. Again, thank you very much for attending today and we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you everyone.